There we go. Okay. We are going to kick off today with a review of what we sort of very quickly got to at the end of lecture on Friday. This is something that's going to be on exercise two. So take a look at this recursive piece of code. One, write the recurrence, which is the code model for this. Then once you've got the recurrence in that nice format that you see over there in master theorem, find the values for A, B, and C. And remember that C is the exponent of any terms of N, which are the non-recursive work in the recursive branch, and then plug and chug it into master theorem. If all of those words are terrifying, don't worry. That's why we're practicing together. So feel free to chat, work on it together. We're going to come back in like four minutes. But go ahead and fill out the Slido. It's going to ask you what the big theta is, which is the results of the plug and chug from the master theorem. Go ahead. Write this recurrence. Let's try it. Let's take a look at what we got for our Slido results. Um, ooh, 115 voters. I like it. Okay, so this is the final stage of the things I asked you to do. So if you didn't get all the way here, it's okay. Remember, I don't grade these on correctness, but let's see what our general responses were. Ooh, okay. I will tell you that theta of n squared is correct. So shout out. I'm glad we got there. Um, but let's talk through it in more detail because, like I said, we are going to ask you to do something exactly like this on your exercises. So this is for you to watch this recording when you're doing those exercises. But let's come back here. Okay, so um, we follow the general pattern of writing code models. I like to start with the, like, I will say least complicated. I don't want to say easy, because none of this is easy, because I'm really mean like that and making you do all this math. But let's start with the least complicated stage of this, counting up the runtime counts for the non-recursive stuff. So maybe we give like a plus one to that check on the base case, and then another plus one for printing out each of those little print lens there. And so then here for the base case, I will represent the base case, which is the D in the master theorem formula there. Like maybe that's two, but I also kind of have to keep in mind for what values of N it applies. And I just sort of directly copy whatever that if statement is. It's like, oh, for values of N less than or equal to 100, great. That's what I am going to put in the branch of my recurrence. Does anyone have any questions on the base case? All right, now we look at the recursive case. And within the recursive case, there is typically some amount of non-recursive work and then the recursive calls. In this situation, we've already kind of given one to that print line. That's the non-recursive work within the recursive branch. And then we've got a for loop that runs 16 times. And inside of the for loop, we have a recursive call to n over 4. So question, does anybody, what did anybody get for the recursive portion of this in their recurrence? I'm looking for a coefficient and then a t of something. Anyone raise their hand and tell me what they got for that? I think it's an interesting one. Way in the back, yeah. Sorry, can you say a little louder? One? OK, I agree that it's like a one method call. I agree. What it, maybe what's a coefficient of the method call when we represent it in the recurrence? Like how many times is this recur recursive call going to be made? Yes, I agree. 16. Thank you. OK. And so if the coefficient is 16, what's in between the parentheses? Like how is n changing each time for this recurrence call? 
I like it, all the way in the back as well. N over four, absolutely. So you might, you know, there's that N over four. It loops 16 times. So here's what our recurrence might look like. And look at, I even just sort of did away with the numbers so we don't have to debate them anymore because I really don't care about the specific numbers when it comes to the constant stuff. But yes, we've got some amount of constant work. I think we kind of agreed it's like two. I don't know. You could argue there's more to it. I don't know. Um, for when n is less than or equal to 100, I pulled that less than or equal to 100 directly from the if statement. Then I pulled the 16 from how many times that recursive call is going to be made because it's inside of a loop. That's where I get the 16 from. And then I just directly copied over that n over 4 from the actual method call. Does anyone have any questions on how we got to this recurrence? So just to make sure we're all on the same page, this recurrence is the code model for this recursive piece of code, or like that first stage in our little like puzzle piece asymptotic analysis pipeline. Now that we've got the code model, we can go do the asymptotic analysis. Now, we're used to maybe looking at the nonlinear stuff where you'd just be like, ah, find the greatest term of n, and that's the complexity class, right? But it's really hard to do that in this recurrence. We don't see clear terms of n, which is why we've got this magical tool called the master theorem. Kind of a, you know, somewhat confident name for a theorem, but gosh darn it, if it isn't effective. And so now looking at this, uh, does anyone raise their hand and tell me what is the value of a to plug and chug into our master theorem? What is a in this? Yes, here. 16, absolutely. OK, what is the value of b in this? Let's see here. Yeah, 4, absolutely. Now maybe the trickiest one, what's the value of c? Yeah, 0, yes. Now you might be like, where do we get that from? There's no terms of n. There, that's where you get it from. If there's no terms of n, then the coefficient of n is 0, because there is no term of n. But I know that's kind of a little weird. Yes, question? So if C was 1, then what we would have in this branch down here is instead of it saying plus constant work, it would probably say plus n. And then that would be a C of 1. If it said plus n squared, that would be a C of 2. If it said plus n cubed, that would be a C of 3. So it's the exponent of n. If there is no n, then we say C is 0, because that sort of means there's no term of n. Good clarifying question. OK, so we've got those values. I love it. Now we plug in chug. So we do log base b of a, which is log base 4 of 16, which according to Wolfram Alpha is 2. Thank you, because I do not own a graphing calculator anymore. And then we compare that to the value of c. Since 2 is greater than c, we are in this case of the master theorem. And now I just sort of plug those numbers back in. And so we use that format. We plug in our numbers. And we get a theta of n to the log base 4 of 16. But we just determined that log base 4 of 16 is 2. So really, we get n squared. Any questions at all on this journey, as I shall be asking you to do it on your own for the exercises? Cool. OK, great. Um, please feel free, ask questions on the Slido. I'll open it back up in a second. We'll look at the questions. Shout out to the TAs for answering any questions on Slido for those of us that don't want to you know, make noise in a crowded room. Uh, some quick announcements. Uh, so one, your first exercise um, that's all about algorithm analysis that is due this evening to Gradescope. Remember, it is an individual submission, but like, you can talk to each other about how to do homework. I actually think magic happens when you explain your process or you hear the process explained to you by someone that isn't using my voice. So I encourage you to do these things in community. But we all know when we've turned in work that we don't understand at all, that's when it's copying, OK? <laughs> Please turn in work that represents your understanding. But I trust all of you as, of course, wonderful adults to do so. Um, exercise two, um, sorry, I know there was an email that said it was live. Uh, scratch that for a hot second. Um, we need to make a couple changes, but it absolutely will be going live this evening. 
Um, keep an eye on the ed board. We'll do that. And that one is uh, going to have some more of this recurrent stuff. And then uh, some about hashing, which is what we're going to start learning today. Um, project one is due Wednesday, um, also at 11.59, pardon me. And project two will be opening on Wednesday. FYI, that one will be a two-week assignment. That one's going to be about hashing, because we're learning hashing this week. Any course administrative questions at this time? Cool. OK. So Friday, we left off um, talking about how to model recursive code. I am going to be very frank with you. I don't have to go through the rest of these slides. It's all stuff that I used to teach a lot more of. But like you've heard me mention, I think I'm continuing to shift away from more of the theory stuff. I still think it's really interesting. I recognize that not all of you are as nerdy as I am. So I'm not really going to go through these slides in detail. But I just wanted to kind of give you a high level touch point on these. But the stuff that I'm going to show you here is other ways to go from a recurrence to the big O, big omega, or big theta. I think one of our friends last Friday asked something along the lines of like, well, what if you have a piece of recursive code and it doesn't fit nicely into that master theorem format? Because master theorem format kind of requires a specific type of looking recurrence, right? And not all recursive code is going to fall into that category. So we do have other ways to do it. The reason I'm telling you, please don't freak out, is because it can get really algebra mathy looking. And I don't want anyone here to be like, oh, no, Casey, you promised you weren't going to be mean to us with math. And now I'm going to show you some scary math. It's OK. This math is for fun. Yeah, OK. Um, so let's talk about another recursive pattern. So we talked about the first recursive pattern, having the input, where the way we get from the top of the recursive stack down to the bottom of the recursive stack is just reducing the input by half every time until essentially we only have one item left to look at. That's our sort of base case. Uh, this is another recursive pattern where we are maintaining the size of n, but we're doing some type of work on it. A classic example of that is the merge sort sorting algorithm in week eight of this course. We're going to go into all of the sorting algorithms in a lot more detail. But the way that merge sort essentially works is I give you a list of unsorted numbers. And if I give you this set of numbers, you look at it and you're like, wow, I don't know how to sort this many numbers. Let me cut it in half and give, I like to think of them as my little recursive robot clones each half, and maybe half of the original is a little easier to sort, but each of those robot recursive calls clones are like, woo, I still don't know how to sort this. And so you break down and you break down and you divide until you get a recursive call where they only have to sort one thing. And a list of one is inherently sorted. That's the logic there. And then all of your little recursive calls, they start to combine their now sorted lists back up together. And so what this means is, is that I am generating recursive calls across all of the values of n, but I'm doing this type of work to sort of divide and then conquer. That's actually the term that we use for this style of algorithm. If this does not make sense to you, like I said, I'm going to go over it in a lot more detail in week eight. But here's the code for it, and here's what the recurrence row would look like. Here's the actual algorithm. You can play with these uh, animations yourself. You can see they sort of split. And then as they recombine, they end up more sorted, so on and so forth. But here's what we might represent this as, as far as recurrence goes. Our base case is if we have only one item, then we're like, return, you're sorted. So that's where we get this 1 if n is less than or equal to 1 in our recurrence. But down here, you see what we do is we make two separate recursive calls where we pass along each half of the array. So we have a 2 coefficient and an n over 2. So we make two recursive calls, each with half of the input. So we're not actually like getting rid of input. We're just distributing it across more recursive calls. So we're never really eliminating. We're just spreading it out. And then we have this after we sort of do the recursive calls, the step that goes merge. And what it does is if you can kind of see here in this last round, if we were combining this array with the 2 and the 8 and this array with the 22, the 57, and the 91, 
we kind of do this like, oh, like the two is, you know, the smallest of all those. It goes here, then comes eight, great. And so we sort of mush these things back together, but in that mush, i.e. the merge in merge sort, that has to still touch each of the items. So we get a linear runtime for that. And so that's where we get this little N hanging off the back here. Questions about how we got to that recurrence from this pseudocode? My goal is that you could at least sort of represent the base case, find the coefficient for the recursive calls, and make sure you under represent the N over whatever in the recursive calls. Yes, question. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So this merge where we pass in the smaller half and the larger half, if you think about that, if I'm going to give it both the smaller half and the larger half, the combined set of inputs across those two is still n. And we're going to have to do this thing where we sort of loop over all of them and put them in sorted order. So there's always a factor of n that's happening. And this is non-recursive work. So there's always an n non-recursive work happening in the recombined stage of this divide and conquer. Cool. Well, then, great. Uh, constant size input and doing work is our pattern here. We're not really reducing the pattern. That's why you can see that like the A and the B, where the A being the coefficient 2 and the B being the way you change the input, they're the same. That's how we're not really reducing, because we're doing two method calls each on half of the input. We're not reducing the input. So. Guess what? This fits really nicely into our master theorem format, which is great. Here you can see how it sort of shakes out. This time we're in the middle case where log base b of a equals c. And so we end up with n log n. And this is also my moment to tell you that pretty much all sorting algorithms that are efficiently optimized like merge sort run in n log n runtime. That's pretty much the fastest that you can get of any generic sized sort. But we will talk about that for an entire week at the end of the course. This is just another example of plugging and chugging into master theorem. Cool. Like I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to like brush past this. I promise we'll just have more time to get into this algorithm later. But I will stop here and look at the Slido because maybe there's some great questions that we should all review together. So hang on, let me pull up slide. Da, 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 da. Let's take a look. Q&A. Cool. <laughs> yes, it is, indeed. Um, OK, for exercise one, is the difference between less n is strictly less than 1 and n is less than or equal to 0? I will say at face value, those things do mean similar, but I'm not exactly sure the context of this unless somebody wants to raise their hand and give me more context on this. But that looks, those things logically do evaluate to the same to me. Um, for exercise one, are there a limited number of resubmissions? Are we penalized for resubmitting an answer? Uh, so this is our first time with the exercises where most of the exercises are auto graded, you know, the ones that are multiple choice and things like that. But there's going to be one problem each week that's not auto graded. The, re the exercises in general do not have a like get the TAs to grade your stuff and then you get to resubmit. This is a sort of one submission and done kind of thing. Um, but you are welcome to resubmit it as many times as you want up until the due date. Now remember, the way that these things work too is that it is due this evening. You can still submit late work up to three days after the due date. And if you're like, Casey, why not longer than that? And it's because the TAs have to do some grading on it. And if I let people turn it in forever, we'd never get back to you, blah, 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 blah. Um, you do not have to inform anyone if you're going to use a late day. You do not have to email me and say, uh, un unexpected things are happening in my life. Can I get an extension? That is literally what late days are for. If you have extreme situations and you are going to run out of your late days, that's when you email me and we can talk about it or if you are not going to make that turn in by the three days after the original due date. Because it will close and you won't be able to submit any more um, after, let's see, Thursday? Is that right? If it's due Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night? Yes. So this will close. You can't submit any more after Thursday. We'll grade the latest submission. And where does the n over 2 for the 2t n Come on, go away, Slido. Unhelpful. 
There we go. Um, where did the n over 2 come from? The n over 2 came from because we were only giving each of the recursive calls half of the array. So half the array, the size over 2, n over 2. Any other questions on anything right now? These are good follow-ups. Yeah. Yes. I, I stand firmly that technically correct always wins the day in this class. So especially if we mess up, uh, we will always give you the points and penalize ourselves on the other side of that. Um, but thank you, yes. And also I will say, when in doubt, the TAs are too good at the EdSTEM. Man, y'all, they are superheroes. So when in doubt, please post on EdSTEM. You're always welcome to post anonymously if you don't want your name to be attached to your question. Um, you're also able to post privately if you just want, say, just the TAs to see it and nobody else. So EdSTEM's hopefully helpful for all of you. OK. Let's do a little more. Let's see. Well, maybe I won't uh, ignore that. Um, so the rest of these recursive patterns, get out of here. Um, the final one is calculating Fibonacci. Here is the code for calculating Fibonacci. Here is what I'm going to refer to as the call tree of Fibonacci. And what's interesting about this one is Fibonacci generates two recursive calls at each individual level. So we get this sort of exponential growth of recursive calls. So I like to kind of draw it out in a tree like this. Like if we passed in the value 4 initially, it would not enter the space case, and then we would have a uh, two calls to Fibonacci, so on and so forth. Um, I think that's even supposed to be n minus 2. Ignore that. Um, I should fix these slides. But the point of this is that we're not really reducing the input down. We're only minusing 1. So we get this sort of exponential growth. We call this doubling the input almost. Um, and so here is a way where you might have a recurrence for it. There you go. And so this is our first example where you can see, because we have that n minus 1, we don't get that nice value of b. This no longer fits our master theorem. So there's different ways to find what we would call the closed form of the recurrence, which is taking it from this recurrence style to more of the like polynomial style we're used to, where we can just pull out the term of n. One of the ways to do that is called unrolling, where you literally just take the pattern and like apply it within itself and do a bunch of really gross algebra and then intuit a pattern. For some brains, this is how things make sense. Mine is not one of those brains, but shout out to you. It's that we're getting deep into the personal preferences of sort of approaches here. Um, but unrolling means just take the uh, definition of the recurrence, apply it to itself over and over, and see if you can intuit a pattern. Here, instead, is a different approach. This is what we call the tree method, where we sort of count up how many recursive calls are happening per layer of recursion. And then we have some more plug and chug stuff. This is the math that I was talking about that might look a little scary. Um, but this is another way to find the closed form of a recurrence, where tree method is another way to sort of visualize how the recursive calls are made. You count how many calls, you plug it into the tree method values, and then you do a bunch of summation identities to get to the closed form. I am not going to ask you to do this. But if you are a math person, this is another way to think about how you get to that runtime of recursive calls. And so those are our three recursive patterns. Um, having the input, which runs in sort of that log rhythmic runtime, remember? That's nice. Uh, constant size input, but still you know, doing a little work. For merge sort, we had n log n. And then calculating Fibonacci, we actually ended up with a 2 to the n runtime. So also, um, if it isn't binary search, if it isn't the having the input, or it isn't merge sort, we've got n log n, I can tell you most recursive uh, code is pretty expensive runtime wise. Uh, in fact, I will say right now, because I feel like I should say it, I have never in my life written a professional line of recursive code. Does that mean that you won't write recursive code professionally? No. But does it mean that recursive code is something that you do need to 
be very conscientious of because of the runtime implications. Yeah, look at how gross Fibonacci is. We would never write Fibonacci this way. We would use something called dynamic programming. We're going to have a whole lecture on that, uh, I think, in week nine of the quarter. Also, these graphs you can see here. Here's the comparison. So that top line, that's 2 to the n. Look at how much faster growing it is than the logarithmic line that almost looks completely flat, even in the small values of n. This is also just to start to help you start to get that gauge of the differences of runtime. Log, log n is a really, a really nice runtime. Right? Like log n grows at a slower rate than even linear time, so that's great. So if we get to an n log n, that's a pretty solid runtime. We write a lot of production code that probably does run an n log n time, but dear lord, a 2 to the n production time runtime would cause a lot of discussion in the code review before we commit to something like that. OK, this ends the portion I'm going to talk about analyzing recursive code. Are there any other questions? about recurrences or this stuff before we dive into our new topic. Cool. OK. Great. So uh, now let's dive into a whole new topic. I will say that all of this analysis stuff that we've talked about, guess what? We're not going to leave it. You're going to apply this to almost everything we do in this course. But from here on out, we're just doing survey of data structures, baby. I'm going to hit you with them fast. I'm going to hit you with a lot of them. This week is hashing. Next week is trees. We've got graphs for weeks, OK? But this one, you could argue this is the most important one to learn. And in fact, this is such an important one to learn that there is often a joke that if you are asked in an interview a question for which you have no idea what the answer is, hail Mary it and say the answer is hashing, because chances are it is. All right? <laughs> So let's do a quick round of review. Uh, if you remember, from here on out, we are going to mostly be talking about the ADT called the dictionary. And the reason that we're so particularly obsess obsessed with the dictionary ADT is because it's a really dense way to store information. Remember, it's those key value pairs that are all stored. Now here is the thing about the dictionary. The dictionary ADT does not require any sort of sequence. The dictionary ADT is really about storing a dense amount of information optimized for lookup. You've got a lookup value of the key. The keys must be unique. The values could be duplicate. I don't know. But what you're going to see is when I generally talk about this, I'm almost always just going to show you the key and how the key is organized, because that's usually the thing that you're getting or putting or looking for. And then the value just kind of comes along for the ride. They're in the passenger seat of the key, really. Um, but the thing to remember about the dictionary is that this ADT, by default, does not include any sense of order. Now, how you implement it data structure-wise, you might choose to use a data structure, like maybe the array, which will kind of give you some sense of order, like maybe if you start to fill it up from index 0 and on. But so like if I called contains key of C, what I would have to do is I would have to look at index 0 and be like, hey, is that key C? No, it's not. It's A. And then I look next door, B, are you C? Nah, it's not. We do that linear search. Um, if we call get, we have to do the same linear search. So contains key just tells us, is that key in the set of keys? Get, you give it a key. It gives you back the value. Put, in this case, since we're going to put a B in there, and a B already exists, because you must have unique values, it will replace the previous entry under that key. So do be conscientious. You know, since we had a B of 2 when we called B in 97, we just replace that 2. We have to have unique keys. And then if we put, you know, maybe we fill up the array, and then we have all the same sort of things that we incurred when we do arrays as an underlying structure. We might have to resize, blah, blah, blah. You can see the runtimes here. We can do the same thing with the uh, linked list. You can see maybe we have two fields, one for the key, one for the value. You can see all the runtimes there. Now let's talk about how to really build a data structure who is purely optimized for lookup. Because that's what we're really trying to get at at this dictionary, right? Like, we're often using a dictionary to store things, to look up things, to access them at a later date. In both of these, we had to do linear search to find everything. Can we do better? So can we do better? 
Uh, let, what if we simplify the problem? And this is a common way that computer scientists think about things is we're like, okay, well, like, let's, let's see if we can do better for a certain situation. So, okay, great, thanks. Um, we could have something we call a direct access map where it's like we know we've got to have these sort of keys in order to find the values, and we know an array by default includes indices. So what if I just only allowed myself to use keys that mapped to indices of the array. And because we can use that direct access of an array, we can just be like, hey, give me the array value at index whatever. Why don't I just force all my keys to be the indices in the array? And then I get that constant time lookup. So like here, if I use the key of three to store the value Shredil, then I can get in and out of that index three with constant time, right? And that is sort of a goal that I want a constant time lookup regardless of how much stuff is in the array. Now you're probably like, Casey, that doesn't look super useful. I promise we're going somewhere. So I can get and put at that. This is what the code for that might look like. You can see I'm just using key where I would use the index of an array. This is something called a direct access map. Look at that beautiful runtime constants all across the board. Delightful. This is the North Star. We are going to start with this, and we are going to try to continue to adapt to this problem to be more and more generically useful without losing our ideal runtimes. So some drawbacks <laughs> of the direct access map. Um, well, what if we wanted to store two keys, the value 0 and the value 9999, well, then we would have to make an array that had the index 9999, and then we would just have like all this empty space in the middle. So this feels weird, right, that we would maybe have to make an array that's huge just to be able to order to use all of those indices. Um, also, this only allows us to use integer keys, which if we were writing like the English dictionary, like those keys are words. They're strings, right? So this doesn't seem super generically useful, but we do have the constant runtime. So how do we continue to eliminate some of these drawbacks? Well, one thing is, how do we do this maybe for any integer so we don't have to make an array that is the perfect size to get all of our things? So we could, again, make a giant array with every possible integer as an index. But that's going to be super wasteful. So like here you can see this is technically an array with indices 0 all the way through, what is this, like 900,000 or something? So instead, we could make a smaller array and create some type of mapping from the indices of the array to the int key values that I have, some type of translation step, if you will. Welcome to hash functions. That's what hashing is, actually. So by definition, a hash function is anything that can be used to map data of an arbitrary size to fix sets values. It's that little translation step between the int key values we want to use and the actual ints that are present as the indices of an array. So one of the most direct, least complicated ways to do this is to take any int value and simply mod it by the size of the array. Mod, as a reminder, is the remainder operator. And so when I do this, I could take any int value, no matter how big, and when I mod it by table size, it's going to spit out a number between 0 and table size minus 1, which means it's going to spit out a valid index of the array. So mod by table size is a way to map any possible int value to the specific set of ints that I am going to use for my underlying sort of collection there. Great, cool. So let's see how this works. Let's say I want to put in the key value pair 0 foo. I would take 0, I would mod it by the table size, which is 10, which gives me 0. And that's where I put that piece of information. If I have 5, 5 mod 10, 5 does not fit into 10, so it fits into 10 zero times with a remainder of 5, great. Put it right there. 11, 
11 divided by 10 is 1 with a remainder of 1. So it can go into the spot at index 1. 18 divided by 10 is 1 with a remainder of 8. So we can put that into index 8. So this step of mod by table size is a way to translate any int value to a valid index in the array. Yes, questions? Question. Aha, thank you. The inevitable first question. This looks so great. This would be amazing. But because I'm mapping from a large set of int values to a small subset of values based on the indices of the array, couldn't we have a scenario where multiple things map to the same index of the array? Yes, we could. Put that thought on pause. <laughs> Any other questions before I reveal what, that real, what the problem there is? Is that everyone's, that's usually everyone's first question about this. So this is, this sort of translation step, we call this the hash function. Sometimes in Java, it's literally called hash code. Um, but here's how you would do it. You would see that we have this sort of hash to validate index method. And all it does is it takes in the K, it mods by table size, blah, 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 so on and so forth. So what we've now got is technically a simple hash map because we are doing this translation step. But we have a glaring problem that I have not addressed yet. But delightful, look at that run time. It's so beautiful. It's like a crisp winter snow before anyone stepped in it. It's perfect. Yeah? Uh, the other thing here that's great about this too is if you need to resize the array when you run out of space, then it's actually pretty inexpensive. You just go over all of the keys again, you mod them by the new table size, you put them in the new spot. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've got a slide all about that. Great, okay, so let's talk about that glaring problem. Again, you're like, okay, Casey, maybe we're getting a little more useful because I don't have to make a, like, an array that's stupid big just to get all the indices, but clearly we might have multiple pieces of data fighting for the same bucket. So again, here's our stuff, and this is exactly the same stuff that we looked at, the same example, but what if I try to put 20 in here. There's already something in spot zero. Well, this is what we call a collision. That's the official term. It's when multiple things hash to the same spot in a hash table. And collisions are the enemy of our perfect runtime. They really mess this whole system up. So. There's all of these brilliant researchers out there that have found all of these different ways to handle this inevitable but undesirable situation of the collision. And in fact, we're going to spend the rest of this lecture and all of lecture on Wednesday talking about how to battle the dreaded collision. But other than collisions, we still have a situation where we are getting constant lookup. And so how we handle the collisions is the thing that will decide how far away from our perfect runtime we get. And we will need to make our choices in how we handle the collisions based on knowing that sometimes we might choose collisions over resizing, so on and so forth, but that's where the design of the hash table really comes in. So um, collision is just when multiple keys translate to the same location. The fewer the collisions, the better the runtime, baby. But we could do two things. One, we could accept that collisions will happen, and we must find good ways to handle it. How do we you know, resolve that bit of conflict? Also, can we design our functions that generate which index of the array you're supposed to go to to minimize the amount of collisions? And we have to do both of these things. We're going to do our best to design the hash table to cause the fewest amount of collisions, but we will also find ways to handle them when they inevitably arise. So uh, there's two general ways of handling hash collisions. The first of which is something called separate chaining. And I absolutely love it because it's so delightfully obvious. What if you just let multiple things live at the same index? 
that's it. That's what separate chaining is. It's like you just sort of make a linked list for all the things that collide into the same box. Uh, so then you have a hash table that's really a collection of buckets or really a collection of linked lists. So now we have an array of linked lists, and that is actually the most common implementation of a hash table. It is what I'm going to be asking you to program for P2. The other way to handle hashing is something called open addressing. We are going to talk about this because you need to know about it, but it is the idea that in you collide to a certain box. Well, there's probably some other box that's still open in the hash table, so let's go find some other box and put it there. I'll go into this in more detail. But let's talk about that separate chaining solution. Um, so instead of having a bucket, each of these uh, indices of the array directly hold any of our entries, we are now going to have an array of linked lists. And so you can see here, it should hopefully be a collection of linked lists with a singular node on it. But in the case of a collision, we just add another node onto the back or the front, wherever really you want it to be. But you can see here, we've got two collisions, one at index one and one at index seven. We just store all those things there. Question about how this works. Can anybody look ahead and imagine a worst case scenario where this is really going to break down? Yeah, all the way in the back. What if you have a very long linked list? In fact, again, taking it to case analysis, the best case scenario, if I'm trying to find something in the hash table, is that each of these linked lists are of size one, that there's no collisions. That's my best case scenario. Again, it's case analysis because there could be a million objects, there could be 10 objects, the best case is still zero collisions. So if the best case is zero collisions, what is the worst case, how many collisions? Yeah, right here. Yes, N collisions. And to your point, what we would get is O of N because if we had N collisions, that means that we're gonna have this, oh, this nice hash table with one linked list of size N. And then I just have to do linear search over again, so I get a linear runtime. So technically, the worst case scenario of a separate chaining hash table could be O of N. We actually would refer to this as a degenerate <laughs> hash table. I didn't pick that word. Um, where you would literally just have N collisions. We are going to do a lot of things to avoid that scenario. And you will find if you talk to anyone and they ask you for the runtime of a hash table, if you're like, well, Professor Casey said that there could be this scenario where you could get a linear runtime if there's n collisions, you are technically correct. But that interviewer will be like, oh my god, what kind of hash table did you write where you got n collisions? Like we, That is so rare that we generally do not even think of that worst case scenario. But you should know that what we're doing is we're trying to avoid that happening. I'm going to teach you all the ways to avoid it so that that's so rare, it almost never happens, and we don't generally consider it. We always think of the in-practice case as being a constant time lookup still for hash tables. But you should know that the specter of the degenerate hash table lurks in the darkness waiting for us to make the wrong design decisions. Yeah? So what you would probably have is you still, like I know I'm kind of again, I'm only showing you a singular element here, but what I'm showing you are the keys. And so you probably actually have key value pairs. And so you would just loop over them, find the one with the key you're looking for, replace its value. Great question. I'm going to leave it there for today. I'll stick around and answer any questions. Keep your eyes out. We will be posting exercise two later today. Come back on Wednesday. We're going to talk more about collisions. Yeah. <laughs>